You're listening to The Raw Reaction on the Angry Marks Podcast Network. Welcome to your Raw Reaction here on AngryMarks.com. I am your host for tonight, Rob the Many. That is, that's right, I have returned uh, after doing my quick plants on football last Thursday. I was asked to come on here and do help do the Raw Recap. Alongside me tonight is Big Vic. Say hi, Big Vic. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? How are you doing this evening? Rob, good to, uh, good to be working with you. I think... Uh, Angry Tensai is the victim of a newborn this evening. He is most likely unconscious right now because of lack of sleep overall. So, or uh, maybe maybe the NFL injury bug got him too. He's a Redskins fan, so I think he's already given up on the season. So I think <laughs> it, it might actually be uh, it, it might actually be children keeping him awake. So I will assume he's getting the best sleep of his life right now, and. Uh, Wish him well. But, Rob, good to work with you. I think we've worked in the past a couple times together. Looking forward to uh, doing coming over tonight's show. Um, obviously, this was the uh, go-home show leading up to the pay-per-view. And despite oh, Don't forget, it was the season premiere episode. Yeah, and, and, and uh, despite Ms.'s wishes, it, this is not actually leading into the Hell in a Cell pay-per-view. <laughs> yeah, I caught that as well. Uh I'm not quite sure what the season premiere means. They never take a break. But I guess if you got to start somewhere, why not start Monday night, the first night of Monday Night Football, I guess. Try to try to tease people that it's something that it's not, I guess. Uh, so it, it was interesting. Um, I, you know, basically my life has been taken over by football. Um, that's basically my number one, like, priority right now. I've even forgotten about MMA, so that tells you how obsessed I am with football. But uh, I tuned in tonight uh, to Raw just to see what was going on, and uh, it was it, it'll be kind of interesting to kind of have like a co-host who watches Raw every week, and versus like a guy who just jumps in every once in a while and just kind of gets bombarded by whatever shenanigans is going on at the time. So that I, I think that distinction is kind of neat because it kind of brings the perspective of somebody who's like outside of the loop with somebody who's kind of like very deep in, and I think that gives the fans a little two different perspectives as far as like wrestling is concerned. Um, you know, I jumped mostly in, in the new day tag team match with, uh, the primetime players, primetime players were the tag team champions going into the match. It was an okay match. It, it, um, it was, uh, you know, it wasn't great, but it wasn't like horrible either. It was definitely a good starter match. You know, um, tag team matches always are traditionally a better start to a night of matches than other matches per se. Um, I still think like the New Day's gimmicks, uh, shenanigans are kind of uh, kind of lifting them to be like more more over than um, I think anybody really ever thought they would ever be. Um, but you know, it's kind of always like trying to find the line between annoying and heel, and uh, periodically they can cross the line either way. Um, the trombone, I think it's funny, but I could definitely see like something like that getting old real quick. Yeah, it's definitely it seems to be doing its trip right now. Um, it's uh, it is pretty pretty interesting. He's actually getting better on the trombone. So I don't know if he's getting lessons, if he's practicing every week, or if he's just sort of who knows. He could have been a Xavier Woods. Apparently, is like a. Um, I think he's like a college professor or something. So I mean, he could be a quick study on the trombone. The trombone, so um, it's doing well with that, and it was uh, got to admit, it was pretty entertaining. What I don't, oh yeah, it, it's definitely entertaining. It's just kind of uh, 
you know, anytime like you do something like that, it's always risky because you're riding a fine line because you're supposed to be kind of getting other people's skins, but you always worry because live crowds, like the live crowd ate that stuff up. Live crowds will always eat something like that off. There's some, sometimes there's a tricky little scenario where like you're performing for a live crowd, but in WWE's case, you're also performing for millions and millions of people at home and they have the power to just change the channel. So, you know, I mean, that's a fine line to walk. And I think they did, they did a nice job. Um, but I, I think it's kind of led to like a lazy, you know, tease for like a hot tag. You know, it kind of, um, there was a moment where, you know, Titus, uh, finally got a hot tag after a long, long beat down of, of, uh, Darren Young. And, um, yeah, it, it was sloppy. It was, uh, the, the heels weren't in the proper position to take any of the moves. Titus was using moves that I would never recommend to use in a hot tag, and it was just a disaster. Um, none of it really looked all that great. It wasn't, and, and therefore the explosion wasn't what it could have been. I kind of missed the days of like 1990, 1980s style tag team hot tag. Um, but that's more of a finicky, uh, a guy who like ha- been in and around wrestling for a long, long time. I'm a bit nitpicky when it comes to high tags because I've, you know, I mean, I've learned the the magic behind the curtain a little bit as far as like where you're supposed to be and the moves you're supposed to use that can best kind of show off, you know, fire. And uh, I felt like they kind of messed that up, and that was a big story for the tag match tonight. So that was kind of a really necessary part for them to screw up, and I felt like the distraction kind of heel tactics outside with the trombone were a little bit wonky. Didn't quite get that story across either. But uh, you have new tag team champions, New Day. So, uh, I mean, I guess I guess the gimmick is fresh enough again for Vince to feel like they deserve the tag titles. Yeah, the one thing, the one thing I, I do not agree with here is basically what what the payoff is. The payoff of this match is getting to defend a championship against uh, against the Dudley Boys, and that I mean, don't get me wrong, the WWE tag division is shit. And there's no mincing words about it. It's not pretty. It hasn't been pretty in a while. I think that we had said a couple weeks ago that hey, you know what, the Dudley Boys are a welcome addition, considering the fact that a couple months ago when DX was. Um, was back in the tag team division, they were the best team. So I think that it, they're a welcome addition, but it feels like they're sort of getting bowed down to as legends in the division and saying, okay, you know what? It's like whoever champion is gets to wrestle these guys. I think they needed to sort of come in and win a couple matches, which they've done, but I think they need to actually like earn their shot. At it so like where they have to feel like they have to put it on the heels just to set up a match with two over heel. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you sort of felt like, hey, you know what? It's like New Day's. Um, they're sort of they're, they're sort of good guys here. They're not going to be, and they haven't really built up with the chemistry. I mean, even last week with the whole Edge and Christian thing um, backstage with the uh, with the New Day and the Dudley Boys. I mean, there was uh, definitely building a rivalry. So I mean, I like to. I like to have matches where you're not 100% sure of the outcome. And unfortunately, uh, this match tonight I sort of had a feeling that New Day was going to come out with the win. Yeah, I mean, if they're, if they're going to do something like that, it's kind of hard not to give them the ending. Um, uh, so that's going to be a match going into uh, Night of the Champions, Dudley Boys versus New Day for the Tag Champions. I'm guessing uh, I would not be surprised if Dudley Boys win. Um, usually when the heel wins that quick to basically go into a match with a Bay face tag team, they're usually a transitional champion. Yeah, yeah, you know what? I think that that's gonna I think that's gonna be the case. Although I I wouldn't mind seeing something that maybe add a bit to the storyline, maybe interference from outside or some sort some sort of a dusty finish that gives them a excuse to prolong this rivalry a little bit. I don't wanna see him just take the championship. Hey. On Easy to on the spoilers there, Big Vic. Uh, so speaking of dusty finishes, so we, we'll, we'll have to talk about one a little bit later, but try not to spoil it ahead of time. Jeez. Uh, yeah. Next up, we had a Charlotte promo. My only complaint here is she's perfectly fine on the microphone. Fine. She's, I guess, passably pretty fine. 
She's super athletic, and that's what she brings to the table. But does she really have to leech off of Ric Flair and do like the woo like every three seconds? I understand Ric Flair's daughter. I get it. I'm not a moron. And it was a really cool moment to see them together. Ric Flair came in like towards the latter end of this promo, and it was kind of a cool moment. But it's just, I don't know, it's just weird because she doesn't quite do it right. And it just like feels like she's got it. Like, it felt like in NXT she was her own person. And now it feels like she's like the female Ric Flair. And, it, and that's a lot to live up to. Yeah, Rob, I, I definitely agree with you there. The one thing I really hate, and the wooing is okay, and having Ric Flair backstage, I think that's great to have him backstage. But everybody knows that she's Ric Flair's daughter. Wrestling fans are not stupid. I, I hate how her, the announcers, her teammates, her, oh, she's not only doing it, but she's doing it with flair. That's just, it, it, it's getting old. I mean, if she said it once, that's fine. It, it's four or five times a broadcast. And, hey, you know what? It's like we've got the hint that he's your daughter. And congratulations. I mean, it's cool that he's backstage to see you, um, to see you in your big match. But, shoot, it's like let's. I mean, try to build something on your own. I feel like they're almost afraid to let her run with it and try to try to be her, be her own wrestler here. And it's just, hey, we better remind somebody that she's Ric Flair's daughter just in case they forgot or just in case they're a first-time viewer. But 95% of the wrestling fans out there, they will figure it out very quickly. Yeah, she did build her own thing, but I guess they just don't trust her. They just keep on going with that. That's that's what's weird. She was perfectly... I don't know why they feel like they have to tinker once they get up to the WWE main roster, but they feel like they have to tinker a little bit of each character. Like, I mean, look at poor Neville, the alien from outer space. I mean, just leave them alone. Just let them be them, and they'll be perfectly fine. They worked for a small crowd like that. All you got to do is just let the casual fans see what we saw, and I think most people will just kind of go along with it. But um, it, it was just kind of I, – I really appreciated the moment because it was cool to see her with her dad. And it obviously it's set up for later, but it, it was just really uh, – I appreciate it. But there's just a little bit of – as a person who enjoys, like, the feministic aspects of what WWE is trying to do with bringing them all in at the same time, it's things like that, like where she can't be her own person. She has to glob off her dad that – a true feminist would like just it just drives me nuts because it's not really a chance it's it's kind of a chance it's kind of it's kind of a revolution it's uh, and and Stevie made the point uh, once on Facebook and with the article you know it's not really a revolution if you have to keep saying it every week you know and putting everybody in factions basically with you know established veterans it's, but, I mean, that's a whole other topic. But I'm just saying, like, I just wish that they would just let her be her. Yeah, I'm just wait- I'm waiting for the first promo where somebody, when she's like, I'm doing it with Flair. Woo. And so, and one of the one of the heels, one of the cool heels, hopefully, says, yeah, it's like, don't, don't worry. It's like, we got, we got the memo. Rick Flair's your father. And, and yeah, just- like, what else do you got? Uh, I mean, nepotism uh, can only get you so far or something like that. That would be really cool. Um, uh, th- I thought the, this led into Sasha versus Paige. Um, they both came out with their groups. Uh, like, like we were talking before. I just feel it's weird to bring in Sasha and I feel like it's weird to put Paige just as a, uh, dre- window dressing, essentially. Um, even in their match, they really didn't really get a chance to do a whole lot, but the little that they did was interesting, um, uh, uh, Big Vic, because Sasha, Apparently, it took like wrestling from 1980-101 and decided to work a body part. And I mean, as an old grumpy wrestling fan, I was shocked when when I saw a heel actually working a body part and working heat on the baby face while working the body part. I mean, I could just hear Stone Cold like marking out on his podcast this week when he, when he, if he talks about it. The problem is, is, however, that when it was time for Paige to do her baby face comeback. She she's selling the arm completely. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like no, it's like it's supposed to, that that arm is supposed to hurt you this entire match and for the next and she month. She hit a she hit a German just fine. Yeah, I mean, hey, you know what? I, I 
appreciate power through something. But yeah, I mean, he had a solid. I mean, she's worked the last ten minutes to. Yeah, but in the 1980s, or in the, even in the early, like mid 1990s, if somebody worked a body part, the person would power through, but they would have to like shake the arm out, or they would do something to show like where it's still affecting them, or they might hit like a big move, but then right after they're like, oh crap, I forgot. That's not that's not right. That's that that hurt. That hurt me maybe more than that hurt them. You know what I mean? Like they did a good job of doing that and. I know, I know, I sound old, but it just it just shows that today's modern wrestlers just can't remember the cell to save their soul. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I think it's a sort of a new day um, in in wrestling where I mean, shit, you have people with re- regu- I mean regularity, they're breaking out of finishing holds. I mean, it seems like John Cena. Yeah. Did, did you see was. the Did you see the German suplex that uh, Sasha received from Paige? I, I did not see that part. I think it was in the bathroom during that. But uh, oh my goodness, it like made me like wince. Uh, she landed very high. Is all I will say. I can't say for sure that she hit her head. You know, the broadcasting team said she did. Um, just for being in the ring, when you land up high on your neck, it could look really, really close. But let's put it this way. She didn't land where she was supposed to. You're supposed to land on the upper part of your middle of your back. And she landed way past that. So I would, I'm i kind of happy she didn't seem like she had a concussion. Of course, you don't know until after. Because sometimes people can wrestle with like concussions. My, my one friend wrestled the entire match concussed. And we had no idea until we got back to the match. He's like, hey, so when's the match? And I was like, well, you just wrestled it. And he was like, oh. I was like, are you okay? He's like, no, not really. And I was like, okay. Uh, but he was perfectly fine, other than, you know, not remembering a match. So, I mean, it's kind of tough to say, but it looked it looked like it hurt. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say that much. Um, but I liked some of the matches. Just I, did, I just didn't like the fact that the baby face uh, basically no-sold um, a really interesting part to the match. And therefore, like, for me, the match kind of fell apart. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely I hear what you're saying. I mean, it's one of those things where you're, like you said, I mean, you're just not, not selling moves. And I, I get powering through stuff, and everybody kicks out everybody's finishers now. I mean, I, I swear to God, I don't think there's been, in the last, really since WrestleMania, I don't think there's been a match where John Cena hasn't had his submission hold broken and his and an AA broken out of since then. I mean, I feel like his whole entire John Cena invitational was basically putting people yeah, but, over. I mean, to a certain extent, I mean, even though he's a veteran, you should know better. You can't really blame him because he's getting the most praise he's ever gotten in his career for oh, the matches absolutely. he's having. So, I mean, he's probably just like, well, if I can get away with that, then that's just what I'm going to do. I don't care if it kills my finish or not. Yeah, and he, exactly. I mean, he's putting, it's, it's good because it's making him come up with new moves and wrestle more than five moves and win. And you know what? It's That's a good thing because I think that, I mean, Ultimately, like you said, I mean, he's getting crazy. I've been thrilled with his work over the last, uh, over the last, really since WrestleMania. I mean, this whole tournament thing he's putting over, I mean, it could be Neville, it could be Cesaro. I mean, it seems like everybody who wins or loses against him is getting a rub off of it and is. Yeah, but not as much of a rub as JR and Stone Cold were trying to pass off a few months ago. Nobody's, nobody's been brought into the main card from wrestling Cena. Nobody's been pushed as a result of a match with Cena. So, I mean, they're, they're getting perceived a certain way, maybe a little bit more seriously, but nobody's been become a star, which is the initial uh, term for getting a rub. So, I mean, I'd, yes, they get I'd, perceived I'd, better, but they don't become a star. You know what? I'd, ar- I'd argue with that. I think that Ke- um, Ke- Kevin Owens could be the exception there. Um, yeah, does he does he have the world title? Is he uh, in the main main event? Is he? Oh no, no, that's right. He's fighting for the IC belt. Yeah, you know, you know, that means absolutely nothing. Exactly, but I mean, at the same time, he's been in uh, WWE for three months now. So I mean, he's had some pretty ho- high profile matches, and you know what I mean. They can't straight shot him up to the championship. He's not necessarily like a Brock Lesnar. But then it's not a rub. See, the initial the initial use of the word rub, while, while never used in common non-nomenclature before, 
um, traditionally was like launching somebody who was kind of on the verge of being a star and putting them in a match with somebody who was already over as a star. Having them win and having them look really, really good. See Sting versus Ric Flair as a, like a really good example. That's 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 rough. That's somebody pass, like basically passing the torch and allowing him access into uh, a stratosphere that he wasn't before. That's not happening nowadays. That's the traditional way that the rub was used, and and I feel like Jr. and people like that are being dishonest because they don't want to be critical a lot of times, and they know they know for a fact that that's how rub was used back in the day. And they know that they're kind of being mis- disingenuous when they use it the way that they use it now. Yeah, you know, you know what? I think that with, with that, I, th- I think we're almost too quick to. I mean, you just mentioned a couple a couple scenarios with the rub. I think you're too we're too quick right now to say, oh, hey, this guy, um, this guy should get a rub off this match or whatever. I think there's, I mean, there's a happy medium there. It's not a. It's not just okay. You know what? He's not getting a rub. I mean, I think that you're gonna have. You might have one to two matches per year where you can literally say it's a like a true monumental rub. Like I'm thinking that again. I don't. I don't know what's gonna go on with Seth Rollins and Sting here. But like, you you think it's like okay, maybe it, let's say this is Sting's last match and he puts over Seth Rollins. Really nicely makes him look really legitimate and makes him look like a good champion, and it just disappears and sort of, sort of retires. I mean that that's something where you're not going to know it necessarily the next week, but you'll know it in the next three to six months. I mean, if he continues to win and as a fighting champion and actually wins legitimate matches, hey, you know what? That Sting match was sort of the start of it. I mean, he's had some fluky victories. He's had some interference over the last, or really since he got his belt, he's had a lot of fluky victories. So I think if you put him over somebody like Sting, especially if Sting puts him over a good, which um, I'm, I'm assuming it's going to happen. I just don't know if it's going to be a fluke or if it's going to be a legitimate victory there. But I think that that's, I, I feel like everybody's looking forward to happen every pay-per-view or every Monday Night Raw to get a rub. And I think that you, something like that, I mean, Hey, you know what? It's it's a good victory, but it's not necessarily a rub. Oh, by the way, Sasha won via tap out, so basically Paige is just another female. So that's that's the uh, other takeaway from this match. Uh, we got next up Ms. TV with Live Family, um, basically just introducing the, uh, the new member. Um, basically, they're trying to intimidate Miz. Then Reigns and Dean came out and. This is where I felt like I tripped on acid and I had like a flashback and I traveled to three years ago or maybe I got into DeLorean and figured out how to time travel because I could swear I've seen this few before somewhere. I just can't remember when I had this weird feeling of deja vu the entire promo and uh, I couldn't escape that feeling. Big Vic. Yeah, you know what? It, it, it reminded me very much of that. But I think that th- this year, and again, I, I, I don't like the buildup and the mystery associated with the who is the mystery partner because it's, I'm sure it's going to be either Eric Rowan or somebody from NXT as their mystery partner. I would have rather I would have rather seen them tonight and seen it be like somebody from NXT and be like, oh, wow, it's like now we have to actually watch the match. Versus, okay, well, we know it's the three freaky Wyatts and who, outside of Bray Wyatt, don't aren't great, and we know we we know what we're getting. It's a known entity right now, and having Randy Orton as their third man, it just doesn't do it for me. I'd, I'd rather see somebody come on from NXT. It's just weird because, like, I I I, yeah, I thought like Wyatt was kind of was kind of headed towards like a world title. Thought Reigns was eventually going to get there. Thought Dean was on his way there, and now it's like none of that ever happened, and we're right back to where they started from. And I'm not sure how much that does them any favors. Yeah, I mean these feuds, they sort of they sort of in placeholders for these wrestlers. I feel like I mean there's no nobody's really getting. I mean it seems like uh, Roman Reigns is 
gotten the majority of victories out of this. And it seems like he's overcoming the odds and everything, but it's not putting him over as like, hey, it's a championship material or, oh, hey, I'm dying for him to get into the main event. I think that uh, the uh, the big thing for him at some point will be to figure out a way to get over as a main event level player. Almost like, I, even even if it's like a ride back a couple of years ago where he was losing every main event on pay-per-view for six months. Um, I, I just don't see out of range right now. I could see him turning heel. Um, I know there's been some talk on the internet about that. I think that wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing. Um, but I don't think, I don't think he'd be a, ever be a, a cool heel. I think he'd be a, a heel heel who betrays Dean Ambrose and you can put, put on a pretty good story with him, but I could eventually see him making a switch just because, I mean, his act is getting, it's getting stale. I mean, it's like you have the 13 and under crowd and, uh, horny female crowd who love him, but unfortunately that's about 10% of the arena every week. Yeah. Um, the other, uh, thing here was, uh, Seamus versus Cena, perfectly fine match. If you've seen, you know, seen his matches as of late on Raw, pretty much wash, rinse, repeat. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying at this point, I feel like I've kind of seen it. Been there, done that. It was a perfectly fine match. It flipped a couple things around, made a couple things feel fresh. Perfectly, best match of the night. Um, but, I mean, what else do you really expect when you're given time and you're allowed to pretty much do whatever it is you want to do? Um any thoughts, Big Vic? No, no, I think this is a serviceable match. I mean, I don't think Sheamus is a match going into the pay-per-view, so I think it's more of a, a hey, a, very similar to Seth Rollins going into um, going into WrestleMania where, hey, you know what? It's like he could lose his first match or not be have a great involvement but still come out as the champion. So I think that that's sort of where we're positioning him on this pay-per-view. I don't believe he has a match. And that could, uh, I mean, he could even end up wrestling on the pre-show and then coming in and um, catching his money in the bank. So they sort of tease that up a little bit. We'll see uh, yeah. what happens with that. Now, this next part, I, I think, is going to draw some interesting discussion, but we'll see. Um, we had Ryback come out with this kind of promo and interrupted by Kevin Owens. And from there, magic ensued. Uh, Kevin Owens was... My wife, you know, you know, it's kind of always interesting when you have somebody who doesn't really watch wrestling, casually observes. Um, you know, me and my wife have been together for a long, long time. She knows my obsession with wrestling. Um, but she always kind of tangentially watches. She doesn't really, like, watch like we do. Um, and she just kind of looked up. She's like, who's this guy? I was like, oh, that's Kevin Owens. She's like, he kind of looks kind of sloppy. Is he any good? I was like, oh, yeah, he's real good. And she's like, okay, I'll give the guy a chance. Within, like, two minutes, like, Kevin Owens had won her over. She's like, this guy has a lot of charisma. Uh, she's like, is that why he's, like, a big deal? I was like, yeah, that's most of what he brings to the table. I was like, he's also a really, really good worker. It's not his physique. <laughs> but I, I found it interesting that somebody that casual could pick up, the chemi- like, the charisma that easily. Yeah. I mean, I think he's been give- he's probably been given some liberty on some promos. Um, I definitely feel like he goes over Ryback here big time. Um, oh man, he destroyed him. I mean, poor Ryback was a little bit in the deep end of the pool here. Ryback can do serviceable promos. I think and he's nowhere near as garbage as he once was. He tries real hard. I got to get the guy credit. I like him after hearing the interview with Chris Jericho. However, putting him in 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 a cage with uh, Kevin Owens on the microphone, I mean, uh, he's gonna look bad, and there's just no way around it. Um, his comebacks to Owens weren't near the spine shivers that Owens was delivering. I mean, Owens owned him in every single way. He attacked him about the, the secret book, called it, uh, called it and said that if he needed that kind of power of positivity to turn his life around, that he was a pretty weak human being. And that he finds it kind of ironic that somebody that big is that weak at the same time. So it, it, that was magic. Um, there was a weird little moment where I think Owens was supposed to throw the book in his face and I I don't know if they didn't catch it or what happened there but there was like a weird little moment where like I felt like Owens was trying to either throw the book out of the ring throw the book at uh, Ryback to kind of add that little uh, 
you know, F you moment. And something went wrong somewhere in here. But despite that one little hiccup, I just thought this was really interesting. And I, I have nothing invested in this feud. But it made me kind of want to watch. It kind of made me really, really interested. Because, I mean, Ryback got owned. But I don't think he like looked necessarily like a bumbling idiot. So considering who he's going up against, he did pretty well. I mean, um, he didn't have the best comebacks, but he didn't necessarily go down without a fight. And for his crowd, his crowd was still behind him when all was said and done. And I think that's all you can really ask for. Yeah, I mean, you know what? I mean, I, I feel like you sort of know where you're getting out of Ryback. And unfortunately, I think that he's going to be, uh, or, or I guess fortunately, at least for Kevin Owens, I think he's going to be dropping the IC strap to Owens at this pay-per-view, which uh, is probably the way overdue. I, I don't know if I could have stomached another big show Miz Ryback match. So I'm pretty uh, pretty stoked to see this uh, this title change, hopefully. And uh, maybe uh, Kevin Owens can bring it to, uh, bring it to the next level. So what I've seen is done with the U.S. T- championship. Did you did you feel like Ryback? That's I mean like Ryback lost. Like it, you know, uh, I felt like Steen was a little bit sharper, a little bit more on his toes, and I felt like maybe a few times you saw Ryback kind of get a little thrown off. But I I don't think like he got clowned. I think like you know you had to really be paying attention to n- notice that Owens kind of got the better end of the deal. You know, was, you know what Owens gets the better of Cena, so I'm not gonna. If he gets the better of Ryback, it's not that big of a deal. I mean, and to me, it's more of a, hey, you know what? It's like you don't expect that much out of somebody like Ryback. I mean, don't get me wrong; his promos are his promos are okay. They serve their purpose. I mean, live, obviously, a little bit more risque than backstage. But I mean, Owens. I mean, he's been toe to toe and pure gold with everybody on uh, everybody on the roster since he's got there. I mean, he's. Um, I, I think he also, in a way, while well, like kind of, kind of, he didn't bury Ryback, but in a way, he kind of reminded everybody about why they started liking Ryback again. Uh, and they reminded everybody of the the secret book promo, in which I think did Ryback favors in a lot of ways, uh, in in, Ry- in uh, Steen's way of tearing it down. I mean, in a, and that's brilliant. You know, that's, I mean, uh, that's. Promo rule number one hundred one. I mean, that, I mean, you're supposed to kind of tear down your opponent, but you're not supposed to tear him down to where, like, if you beat him, you're like, well, of course you beat him. Uh, he's nobody. And if you lose, then you look like a loser because you, you lost to a loser. So it, it's kind of like a, it's a tricky uh, place you got to kind of be where you got to have something to come at them with, but you can't necessarily take their legs out from underneath them, or else when you beat them, it doesn't mean nothing. I felt I felt like Steen did a really good job of writing that. Uh, did he did he make you look forward to this match? Uh, more so than before. I mean, I th- this match and again, I'm not sure. This match, I think, might is might be one of either the more. Or it's definitely one of the overshadowed matches on here. But it's uh, I I don't know. I I feel like any any match with Kevin Owens right now is a must see match. I think that that's similar. I mean, he's up there with Cesaro as far as like. Just pure wrestlers who I feel like I'm going to get a 10 to 15 minute match on any pay per view. You can put them against Ryback or Big Show, and you're going to see something. You're going to see something that you want to see. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, and he's I, I, doing I, a feat that uh, Cesaro are doing out there, but he is. Um, I mean, he'll do, he'll do something cool, or he'll put it. He's almost like a Dean Ambrose in the ring, as far as like you'll see new moves. Out of him. It, it's, it's cool because he's sort of like the new fresh guy and he wants to be like, hey, he has the chemistry with a guy like Ryback, really whoever he's going to do it, where they trust each other and they'll try to put together some new cool move that'll get the crowd saying, holy shit, holy shit. Um, so I, that's sort of that's sort of how I, I see Owens. Um, I think that, uh, I mean, he's the best thing to come out of uh, NXT in a while. And it's just... Uh, it's just he, he's backing up because he's good on the mic. And, I mean, he's a good wrestler, good moveset. Like you said, pretty uh, sloppy-looking appearance. But you know what? If you can wrestle, you can talk, and you can put on a good show, I'll take that over uh, over looking good. I mean, Stone Cold Steve Austin never came out looking like a million bucks. And, I mean, he won by being 
charismatic and a decent wrestler and great on the mic. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, the fact that was probably like, in my opinion, as far as like somebody who really wanted to be watching football was, uh, made me mad. This, this next thing that just, I mean, absolutely pissed me off. Neville, Lucha Dragons versus Stardust and Ascension. And there was no match. There was no purpose. Uh, they, they, they did like two sloppy moves to the Lucha Dragons. Um, there's a clusterfuck somewhere over in the yonder between Neville and Stardust. And then started us in a session ran away. And there was no bell, there was no nothing, there's and then music was played and then that was that. Yeah, you know what? Um Baffling. And, and that's what we've we've talked about this before. Ascension absolutely gotten buried since they got out here in WWE. Um I blame WWE for that. I mean their booking's been horrible for them. And I d I just don't know if there's recovery. I mean I think that their their best chance to recover would have been to team them up with somebody like Bray Wyatt and somebody to follow, not somebody like Cody Rhodes. Who's just like, hey, you know what? So you don't really have much going. You just had your match with uh, uh, that one Hollywood guy and um, Neville, same thing. You don't really have much going on. Let's just take you or match you guys up with some tag teams and uh, we'll try to start a feud from there. But I mean, I don't even see, I don't even see these interactions being pre-show material. I think this is like WWE superstars matches in the yeah, making. Yeah, definitely. I mean, especially when there's no decision, there's no nothing. It's just, basically, they just threw it out there. They're like, hey, these guys are still on the roster. Uh, maybe maybe what happened here, and I'll, I'll, I'll open this theory out there, and I'm sure most people will probably agree, maybe they wanted to cut this so that, uh, you know, the next match could get more time, but then why have the match at all? That's 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 the only thing I'm I'm throwing at, but that's the only thing I can see is why they basically had no finish. Yeah, yeah. You know what? I'm not that. I, to be honest with you, the caliber of these wrestlers and the time that they put in and the story they put on, it doesn't really deserve a acknowledgement of. Oh, geez, why why didn't they have a finish? I was really looking forward to it. It's just sort of. Eh, <laughs> it's it, it's sort of hey, you know what? It's sort of shit, and they gave them about four minutes of air time, and that's pretty much about right. That's all they really needed. All right, so let's talk about the highlight of the night uh, in my eyes. Um, definitely, in my opinion, like the, the uh, uh, if not match of the night by most people's standards, to be really surprised. Uh, Bree, I'm sorry, Nikki Bella uh, versus Charlotte for the, the Divas Championship. Um, going into the match, I made a big deal about how, like, at midnight, Nikki was going to pass AJ for the longest reigning champion, and Charlotte had to beat her, or else she would. And it, it was a decent story. I mean, I'm not going to hate it. It's more of a story than any other women's match in the, that has ever gotten, for the most part. Um, and they wrestled a really good match. Um, again, uh, the women came out, and they wrestled more of a formulaic, uh, style of match, which I don't hate. I, I know it's not exactly uh, NXT, but hey, you're working Nikki. I mean, you gotta kind of hinder the limitation. You got a little bit of a limitation there. Uh, so, I mean, Charlotte can't quite go out there and do everything that she usually does, but I felt like she put, she showed that she belongs in this, uh, you know, level of women's wrestling and she showed like why she was so popular in XT to the casuals. Um, and it was a really, really interesting story. Um, then we had, um, them wrestling a match. Charlotte gets the upper hand. Mickey tries to cheat by using twin magic and Charlotte beats Brie. Uh, one, two, three in the middle of the ring. And the crowd really, uh, ate this up. I mean, the crowd had a positive reaction to this match. Uh, by and large, I mean, they really uh, were interested in what the fallout was of this match was going to be. And when Charlotte won, crowd uh, popped. I mean, uh, that's the only word I could use for it. Uh, everybody was really, really happy. Ric Flair was in the house. Ric Flair was happy. Everybody was happy. And then, and then we got the dusty finish, people. That's right, the dusty finish. Uh, Stephanie McMahon came out, explained that you know since Bree is not Nikki. Um, you know, basically she can't she can't win the world title off of beating somebody that wasn't in the match. And I uh, and since 
Bree touched Charlotte. Uh, you know, Nikki's disqualified, and on upon a disqualification, Nikki retains the belt. And 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 it, I mean, I don't mind a dusty finish. You know, um, I think it has its place, especially if you're trying to get to a pay per view match with these two girls. But what really sold, you know, what could have been a crappy ending was the reactions of both sides here. Uh, made my day. Um, Nikki being ecstatic, knowing that she was going to break the record, was cracking me up because I thought her antics outside the ring were just awesome. And my wife was actually laughing because she said, that's so what a like you know bitch woman would do. So just rub your nose in it and just... You know, be super elated while you're over there crushed. And, and meanwhile, in the ring, Charlotte was just broken. Charlotte did a really good job of selling that that title meant the world to her. She was so happy. And then she did an awesome job of flipping those emotions. She got herself upset, got herself kind of carried. You know, she got a uh, you know a fatherly hug from Ric Flair, which was a really neat moment. I, I thought these two girls uh, really took like kind of what most people might consider a lazy WWE booking to get to the big rematch and made it work and made it work with mostly facials. And that is old school stuff. And I was eating that up. Yeah. And you know what? I, I think that this was, this was sort of a, this is almost a test before, like you said, before dusty finish, I think this was almost a test. See exactly what the crowd reaction would be to, um, Charlotte winning the championship. Yeah, this is the Chris Jericho moment. Uh, remember when they gave Chris Jericho the win over Triple H and the crowd popped, and that's the day Vince McMahon realized that Jericho was, was ready? Yeah, exactly. I think that they've done – they did this on a smaller scale. I think that uh, – assuming that she defend, they have a rematch at the Night of Champions, I assume that Charlotte's going to get the strap. Um, I, I don't necessarily think that it's anything like this moment or, or like that moment. But I do think it's saying, hey, you know what? It's like Nikki Bella's been a champ for a while. You know, we have this whole diva revolution thing. Let's put the strap on some new blood and let's see it. Let's see her swap win or let's see her swap the strap around a little bit. I wouldn't mind seeing Sasha Banks win it or Paige turn on him, maybe turn heel and win it. I'd like. I mean, I think that there's some there's some good wrestling if they do it right. They can. Uh, they can make the Divas division interesting for uh, for quite a while. I feel like it's got pretty stale up until maybe two three months ago, and now we're uh, we're making our way to, through uh, a little bit of a recovery with this with uh, all this new talent up here. What it does is it opens up more matchups, uh, and it it puts Charlotte in the driver's seat versus somebody like Nikki, where you have limitations. And now we can kind of see maybe what it might look like as far as like the main roster divas, you know, style with Charlotte running on top. We'll see if they let them go and really kind of be what they were in NXT. That'll be interesting. Um, what will be interesting is to see who turns and who does it to kind of set up more opponents for Charlotte. I'm going to guess while not having a year long reign, she will have, uh, you know, probably, Three to four month reign, baby faces never hold on to it as long as the heels. Um, and plus, there's this uh, Sasha. Uh, I think is just you know money. I, I I actually like Sasha more than I like Charlotte. I think uh, Sasha, while not as good of a wrestler, is close and has way better personality, way more of a gimmick, uh, and just ha- it exudes a lot more of a star to me than Charlotte does. Um, it, and I, I think, you know, creating, putting the belt on Charlotte seems like the smart move to kind of open up, you know, the real revolution and kind of really let them go and to take off the limitations a little bit and take off the like, handcuffs behind her back and kind of let these girls go. Um, but like I said, I, I, I thought, you know, um, I really wanted to be watching football, but this 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 uh, this segment really made it worth watching Raw. I, I really liked this segment. I thought everybody that was involved in the segment uh, did a masterful job of doing what they were supposed to be doing. You know, Charlotte did a masterful job of making you care that she won the title. She did a masterful job of making you care that she didn't win the title. Nikki did a masterful job of making you hate her because she gets gets to keep the belt. And Stephanie 
the the only part that like I didn't really like I could nitpick was Stephanie, and because she's a heel, and coming out and making sure Nikki keeps the belt made sense. I, uh, that made sense. That 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 fit. But then she sets up the match uh, at Night of Champions between Charlotte and Nikki, and basically puts the stipulation that if she gets disqualified, if she gets counted out, whatever, she will lose the title. So she has to basically beat Charlotte or she will lose the belt. I felt that was a babyface move, and that part just had me all confused. Yeah, but if you look at if you look at the last probably month or two with Triple H and Stephanie, I feel like they've sort of they're sort of in flux. I mean, they were the ultimate heels. And now that Seth Rollins is sort of, the, there's no more authority. It's sort of Seth Rollins on his own now. I mean, it feels like they've been a bigger, like, detriment to him um, in the recent months. Um, basically saying, hey, you know what? It's okay. You're, you're great. You're so great. Hey, you're going to have a sting and Cena at the pay per view. Stuff that you, if they were true heels, you wouldn't get. I mean, I get that Seth Rollins, he's, I mean, he's so great at having people hate him that it makes it easier to do something like that to him. But, I mean, I feel like uh, Triple H and Stephanie McMahon have sort of, they've sort of crossed that line, and I, I feel like they're almost more of a face, or we want to do not necessarily best for business, because I think that's just sort of a, a tagline there, or it's definitely just a tagline they were using to justify whatever they wanted, putting on the match, like matches that the people want to see and matches that are more fair for people or for uh, for the faces versus uh, what they were doing as the authority. Yeah. The, the next segment uh, is another segment where I didn't really care that much and I really wanted to flip over the football was uh, Rusev versus Cesaro. Nothing against these guys, but uh, this hell over it's all Rusev. Time for them to move on. Time is basically everything there is to do. I just don't care. Yeah, I'm not really sure where that feud goes uh, or where that feud this match went. I think this match could have been a very serviceable match at a pay per view. Um, I think both of them. I mean, Rusev is a freaking is a star, um, or I mean, he's he, he's over and he's a pretty good star. And then we have Cesaro, who I mean, he's freaking he's a monster ring, and I love watching him. I mean, I, I'll watch. Basically, him and Kevin Owens are the two people I need to see on a pay per view. Um, if I'm, you know, those are the matches I want to turn off, along with maybe the pay per view main event. But uh, yeah, having these guys not really not hyped at all, and in one of not the main event spot, but sort of the semi main event spot, it just doesn't do them justice. More so the yeah. fact that they weren't hyped at all this match, which I mean that this would have been a match if they said something at the beginning of the show, which I don't think they did. This would have been something where I'm like, okay, this is the match I want to see. Definitely, I I, I agree with that. It, it, it's nothing against these guys. Uh, it really isn't. It's just, um, you know, it basically was just, you know, cannon fodder. They continued the Dolph and Rusev thing with some crazy antics where Dolph gave like some kind of present to Summer. So uh, it was just uh, hate window dressing matches where it's really for something else. When it's this obvious, I mean, most of the matches tonight, because it's the go home show, are ostensibly those kind of matches. But I felt like this match probably hit it the least. Um, I feel like it's a waste of talent to have Cesaro in this match because I mean, he can put on he can put on a real match, and I think his efforts um, were getting overshadowed here. Or, I mean, I think they, they should be maybe putting in somebody like Neville or Adam Rose or somebody who's going to go over rather quickly with this. But I just didn't like I – didn't, I didn't like the booking here. Yeah. And the, the next the next uh, topic uh, is the uh, main event for the go-home show going into Night of the Champions. The season premiere of Monday Night Raw uh, is that, uh, the, the main event is Sting's first match on Raw uh, versus Big Show. So when they announced that, I, you know, Whatever chubby some person who loves things had instantly went away. Um, and the match was kind of started. Um, it was what it was. Um, one old guy wrestling a big fat guy. 
and uh, they were trying to figure a way to work around the size difference and whatever Sting's limitations are. Um, just when you kind of were like, okay, what, what what's going to happen here? You know, knowing that it's going into the pay-per-view, boom, there you go. Um, just what you thought. Uh, so Home Seth Hall out. So the world just straight up attacks um, Sting and and then uh, Rollins and Show start doing the double team. And just, da, 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 da. Here comes Super Cena to save the day. And I was just kind of like, really? This is how Raw is going off? Is this this trite of a, of an ending? But no, it got more trite. Uh, Triple H came out and said that this match was going to start anew. It would be a tag match. Cena versus Sting versus Show and Rollins. And it starts now. I was just like rolling my eyes, and wishing I could change it to football. And, and even though the Monday night game is really, really boring, uh, it's better than this. And then I just really wanted to like, you know, take a shotgun, and blow my brains out. It was stupid and dumb. So everything that I hate about like a go home show, it's just lazy, lazy booking. Yeah. And you know what? I mean, just in case there's any doubt that Seth Rollins was going to win on the pay per view. He lost. Sting it. went over. Yeah, Sting gave. Yeah, this is it, it, usually whoever wins the the going into the review is the guy that loses just about like eighty percent of the time. Yeah. So, and I mean, I don't think that anybody. I mean, not, I think it should be a disaster if they actually had Sting go over and win the championship at the pay per view. Outside of maybe being a, a placeholder for. Uh, for Seamus, but at at the same time, I yeah, don't we think... still have no idea what exactly he can do at this at this stage of his career. Yeah, we still it's, haven't it's, really seen him it's, really, it's, really go, and I think the reason for that is because he can't. Yeah, I mean, that's I, the only thing I can assume. Yeah, and you know what? I think it's a real disservice for him if he does if he does win a championship and loses it ten minutes later to Seamus, considering the fact that I mean he's. Brought on as the icon, this legend from WCW. I mean, let him have his matches, let him have his spots, let him have his build, and then let him wrestle two, three times a year. That's fine. But putting him on each and every week is a disaster waiting to happen. Yeah, I, I agree. I'm, I'm not saying like uh, um, anything negative about saying. I'm just saying like uh, as far as like go home show endings go. Like I've seen this ending millions and millions of times, and it's just really, really, really frustrating for a W fan who, you know, uh, just wants something, something different. You know, when they when they do when they touch that nerve, you know, it's so easy to love wrestling. But when they do something like this, where you've seen it, you know, so many times, it, it's really hard to care because you know, to you, you've seen it. You know, to young kids or people who still have that kind of buzz about wrestling. Like, oh, okay, you know, they kind of know the deal, and they're they're a little bit more into it. But for somebody like me, who's been watching wrestling pretty much since he was, like, six years old, I mean, I'm just not going to move the needle much for me at all. And, uh, you know, and as soon as they announced the match, I knew there had to be some kind of way out of it, because I knew they weren't just going to throw a sting match away for free on TV, even if they don't really make, you know, crazy money, like, with the network, you know. Um, uh, they just, that's just not, this is not smart. And, and plus I also knew like with size difference and stuff like that, I just wasn't confident that either person could really carry this match to be any what decent it would only expose staying to people who are still a little bit, um, unsure of how to react to him. You know, I still feel like the casual fan who doesn't know who Sting is. Um, because apparently, you know, today's generation just doesn't care about you know, doing research. You know, God forbid they watch like a DVD or something. Um, they still don't quite give Sting the reaction that you would expect him to get. And they and basically tonight, you know, the ongoing backdrop to tonight was she is showing you know clips of Sting doing momentous things. But at, at the same time, I while well, I understand what they're trying to do. From the kind of remind you of how old Sting is at the same time. Yeah, I mean they were showing his highlights from 1988. Yeah, and so all you have to do is do math. He's like, okay, if he's let's say he's 20, 26 there. I mean, you know, it's 1988. You know, I mean, people, people, wrestling fans could be dumb, but they're not that dumb. They can do simple math. You know, 
they're like, okay, that guy's like 50, 60 years old. I mean, why should we care? Mm-hmm. Uh, but like, uh, like overall, like I felt like there was a couple highlights, um, like like the Divas match and the Cena match and the tag match. But there was also a couple of those things that just made me realize that you know, uh, watching Raw is it, it, really frustrating for somebody like me because one, I don't really think it's really written for me, on for the most part. Two, I've seen most of what they have to offer. And there's really nothing for me to really get except for those few occasions they decide to care to do something crazy like where Brock Lesnar comes out and destroys the raw set and F5 is Michael Cole. And then I might care. But unless they do something crazy like that, it's going to be hard for me. It's going to be a bit of a chore to watch raw. Yeah, yeah, I hear what you're saying. Um, really quick, um, I'm good to get your feelings. I felt similar. Obviously, this is a go home show, so you're sort of limited expectations as far as what you're going to get. Um, however, I do want to get your uh, your predictions, I and mean, we can both go through these predictions for Night of Champions, um, next big pay-per-view here coming up this uh, this Sunday. Um, what are your thoughts on each of the matches here? We'll start with, uh, we'll start our way at top, work our way down. Okay. Uh, I hope you have the matches down. Actually, you know what? Seth Rollins, let's go to Seth Rollins and John Cena first. Who wins that? Uh, Seth Rollins Sting? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Seth Rollins should, and I stress should, go over here. Yeah. I, I, and I, I feel like we're almost at a point where if he gets if he gets a bullshit finish on Sting, that really makes him look like a crappy champion because, you know what, he's had some good matches. He went over Dean Ambrose clean. Um, but he's also had, I mean, he's had his fair share of, okay, Undertaker comes out and, uh, beats the crap out of Lesnar, um, John Stewart. I mean, he's had his fair share of, and it's not necessarily stuff that he controlled, but he's had a fair share of shitty finishes as the champ to keep the belt. I think if this one, I think he needs to go over and clean. And again, I don't know if this is a necessarily a torch, torch patching, that torch passing match, but it should be, I mean, there should not be any, um, shenanigans with the finish here. I think that he needs to go over staying here. And you know what? If it sets up a match at WrestleMania or Survivor Series, that match could be a torch, torch patching match. I mean, there's not enough buildup and this is not enough, big, this is not a big enough pay per view. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I feel like this is sort of, uh, a match he really has to go over. And what about your thoughts on, uh, Seth Rollins and Cena? So Seth Rollins is doing double duty. Yeah, Seth Rollins is a uh, Knight of Champions. He has two championships. Okay. So he's I didn't, I just, I, they didn't make that abundantly clear tonight. That was the only reason why I, I asked. Uh, uh, I, I guess, I guess, you know, you could say that, uh, you know, it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense to kind of put the belt on Rollins, but at the same time, it also doesn't make sense for him to have two belts. Kind of, kind of leaves. Your one of your mid card belts kind of hanging in the wind there. Now, what I would like for them to do is have Seth Rollins beat Cena. Well, I know I'm talking crazy talk there, uh, and just kind of meld the U.S. belt in with the uh, WWE belt and just eliminate that mid card belt forever. Yeah, you know what? I could see something like that happening. I'd almost rather see him, Seth Rollins, win against Cena and say, "Ah, uh, you know what." screw it. It's like, this belt isn't worth crap. I'm just going to give it to Cena. That way Cena has the belt. And then Cena's sort of like, he's like on a mission to build that belt up to a title contender for the WWE Championship. Yeah. I mean, they, but, I mean they, there could also be a, I feel like this could also be like a no finish kind of match, like where Rollins just gets qualified if he can, and and that way he can just go focus on the main 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 belt. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think that Cena, I, I think ultimately Cena walked out with the belt, whether it's a completely clean finish. I, I'm only actually leaning towards a completely clean finish where he takes the belt, but I could see something where it's such as like, no, I, I don't even need this. Woo! Woo! I'm so pumped. Yes! I won my week one matchup. I'm happy. Sorry, fantasy football concerns have, have been solved. I'm very, very excited right now. Um, so what's the next match? 
We have uh, New Day versus the Dudleys. Yeah, yeah. See, this is tricky. You don't know whether or not uh, New Day are are just hanging on to the belts because they're heels and they need the belly, belly boys to beat heels, or if they're going to stay champions and the belly boys are going to chase them for a little bit. I'm going to go ahead and pick New Day, I guess, and, 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 and anticipate maybe a little bit of a longer feud here. You know what? I'm going I'm to go with the Dudleys here. Because, I mean, I think the WWE has been jacking them off since they got back. I feel like they probably, in their contract agreement, they probably made some sort of agreement, hey, we need to get the belts within a month or it's not worth it to us. I mean, these guys are just getting pushed down our throats, whether we like it or not. And, I mean, don't get me wrong, I love the Dudleys. But, uh, I mean, it's getting, they got hot shotted way too fast. But I think that it culminates with them taking the titles. Good. Yeah, like I said, that I don't feel great about it, but uh, uh, I'm going to stick with my uh, UJ pick. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, next uh, next up, we have Ryback and Owens. I think we talked about this matchup a little bit. Uh, yeah, going into- um, I can see Owens winning. I can see Owens kind of trying, again, you know, this, this formula of trying to make people care about the IC belt. I think uh, making casual fans care about the IC belt is kind of a Wish and a prayer and a fart, you know, in the air. It's just not going to ever happen. But, yeah, you, but can make the, I mean, you can make the internet fans care. I'll just say, though, you know what? I I, th- I think that uh, I, I agree with you that Kevin Owens wins. But I do disagree that because about talking about making it matter. Because look at what John Cena did with the U.S. Championship. Yes, but look at the lengths they had to go to to make people care. And and by and large, most people were more won over by the matches, not so much the belt. But I, I get what you're saying. I, it can be done, but my whole point is I'm not so sure that we can really focus that hard on two undercard belts at, at the same time that that well. Yeah, yeah, I understand what you're saying. Um, all right. Um, next up, uh, Nikki Bella versus uh, Charlotte. Charlotte's a new champion with Flair. Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously they just wanted to give Nikki the 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 title of longest reign champion just to get AJ off the books, and then Charlotte's going to immediately win, and and it's going to set up better matches down the line. Um, you could give Nikki some, you know, you could set up an, a rematch, have Charlotte beat Nikki again, you could do Bree, and then you could go on to people who are new faces and more interesting matchups. Um, I, I think that's as far as like booking, uh, that would give you know the next three or four months. That's that makes more sense to me. Yep, yeah, I agree. Charlotte's sure, gonna get a win with Flair. Uh, <laughs> I, I, want to say, I, I agree with you completely, though, on booking down the road. Next up, we have the Shield minus Seth Rollins versus the Wyatts. Uh, I, 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 I feel like, uh, you know, Thanks. this is one of those things of, uh, it depends on who the, who the surprise person is. I mean, uh, I have a strong suspicion. Who's your, who's your pick for the surprise entrance? Finn Balor. Who? Finn Balor. Okay. You know what? I'm going with, I'm going with Cesaro. Eh, no, nah, that's not a surprise. He's on the roster. I'd be like, eh. I think it's going to be Finn Balor or, or maybe Big Cass. You know, it's kind of equal the giant with another giant. I don't know. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see who they get, get for this. Who do you pick to, who do you pick to win the match? The baby faces, of course. I mean, the baby faces have the surprise advantage. Um, and, uh, that, that will be enough to kind of feed them another win. Um, not to mention, you know, I mean, Reigns is basically just being fed victories to try to, gear him up again for a potential title run. Yeah. All right. Uh, Dolph Ziggler, Rusev, can we please put this for all, this uh, feud to an end? I don't know. Who do you think has to win for this feud to be over? I think Ziggler does. Or I, I want to see Ziggler win it because I, I picture him going to bigger and better things. I sort of see Rusev as a mid-card heel with limited upside. I guess I, I guess I, I'll, I'll agree with that just because I want to see this end and may it never ever be heard from again. I could see though it going the other way. By the way, they teased tonight 
I know you really don't want to hear this, but you know, with Ziggler giving the present to Summer, you see uh, what's her face getting jealous and turning on Dolph uh, and going back with Rusev. Yeah, I'm not. That match is sort of. It's made me not care. I mean, well, I can't blame you there. It's 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 really really bad TV. Yeah, and last but not least, we have a uh, a new match, and this is the pre-show match. And I actually alluded to this before, not knowing that this was going to be a pre-show match. We have Stardust and the Ascension versus Neville and the Lucha Dragons. I hope Stardust and Ascension win just to troll everybody. Uh, because it's such a stupid gimmick. And I could see them actually, like, if they make the Ascension a little bit more car- cartoonish, it could actually be kind of an entertaining gimmick. Yeah, especially considering that they've been sort of the Ascension to this point, and they've been freaking, they've flown like a lead balloon in the, in the uh, tag divisions. I mean, I thought they were going to be, like, title contenders right away, and I think they could have been. However, they got put with, uh, like we were talking about before, I mean, they just got stuck with a really, really, really bad gimmick. Yeah, I mean, they they had some go the heat for some reason. not quite sure what they did to really draw that. But from the get-go, everybody kind of shitted all over them. And from there, they've kind of been behind the box. I think this could be something that they need, to be honest, to be stuck with somebody like Stardust who just makes whatever is given to them work. Because maybe he can kind of give them advice on how to cartoon up their thing even more, and they could kind of be like the cartoon villains uh, versus uh, you know Neville's you know superhero antics, especially with the Lucha Dragons by the side. They could kind of be like you know a fun little kid feud that kind of entertains little kids. I I, I think that's what we could get out of this. Yeah, and you know what they're they're. Um... This, this might actually be the first pay per view that they've wrestled on, I think. So, uh, yeah. this, this sadly, this is a step up for the Ascension. Uh, <laughs> a but, big step. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and pick Stardust and Ascension, not for any really good, solid reason, but just because I think it'd be kind of, it, it makes more sense. Uh, but I could definitely see it going the other way because, I mean, why would they give Stardust and Ascension a victory? But, you know, I really have no strong opinion on this match. Yeah, I, I think I'm going to lean slightly towards Neville um, and the Lucha Dragons winning again. I mean, I don't know. It's I, I consider this one sort of a coin flip, and I mean, this match was put together about two hours ago. Yeah. What, what will be interesting is to see how much the feuds turn over coming out, out of Night of the Champions for next next week's Raw. Um, you know, we should have, like, if our predictions are roughly right, which we agreed on a lot. Charlotte will be champion, so it'll be interesting to see where they go from there. I think the most obvious place would probably be a rematch. Whether that happens on Raw or a pay-per-view is where where we need to figure out where that's going. And then from there, I feel like a lot of the feuds need to be switched. I think yeah. everything needs to kind of be reset and everybody needs to go on to somebody different. And that's where, you know, anytime you go into after a pay-per-view and you go into Raw with that kind of feeling in the air, um, it usually takes a couple of weeks for everything to kind of get going again. So next week, Raw could be really, really tedious because they're going to be laying groundwork for the next couple of weeks to set up the next show. Yeah, but at the same time, I, I, I like that because it gives us something – I, I don't like it when they come out like, okay, they came out of SummerSlam and that that next that following Monday, okay, we're going to book Seth Rollins in two matches because then you basically have a month long to build it up. And I mean, like you're saying, like the fact, I mean, I, I, again, I don't know how much you watch Raw or you pay attention or read the dirt sheets, but the fact that you didn't know that he's wrestling two matches, I mean, they made the announcement way too long ago. I think that if they put him, okay, you know what, you're going to wrestle for, even if they said you're going to wrestle for both titles at the pay-per-view, and we're not going to tell you until the go-home show who you're wrestling both the championship for, even if they said, hey, you know what, you're going to wrestle Cena for the U.S. strap, but as far as the um, world championship, we're not going to tell you who you're wrestling until the show before the pay-per-view. Because think about it. If you go into this show not knowing 
I mean, Sting is what it is. If he wasn't involved in this at all, it wouldn't be a big deal. But if he, if you, if you go into the show, you're looking at okay, who doesn't have a match right now? You have Cesaro, you have Randy Orton, and then and again, I think Randy Orton's been run off TV um, after last week. Cesaro, I don't know what they're gonna do with him. I think he's third man in the uh, Wyatt uh, feud. But uh, I mean, just think how ballistic the crowd will go if this was the unveiling of Sting coming back. That would get, I mean, it got pop when he first got out there and he got like a short pop, but then people are realizing like, Hey, wait, it's going to be like 60 year old stink. And I mean, his, his prime was the eighties or the, the late eighties, early nineties. I mean, he's past his prime. He's not going to put on a 20, 30 minute match. I don't think, but, uh, I mean, I think that, I, I think that, that having this match set so far ahead of time did not do it or sort of got it past like, there's no real justification for him winning it at all. Versus if I think if it was announced this week, this is who you're going to face. Yeah, it would have felt it would have felt bigger. It would have felt like, oh, oh, okay. Exactly. I mean, because that match, right now, that match is not selling me on the pay-per-view. I don't know if there is a match selling me on the pay-per-view, but that's not a championship match. I mean, it's not. Because, I mean, if you had it as a mystery, you could have even had Brock Lesnar in there as a potential yeah. candidate to wrestle. No, I mean, it really isn't. Like, a main event. There's, you know, yeah, like more prominent events, but like you said, I mean, there's no, there's no main event that, I, and no main event that you have to see, and you're expecting a epic once in a lifetime match. Definitely. Well, um, I, that, I felt like that we we tackled most of what, what what we need to get across. Be interesting what the fallout is for Night of Champions. See how our predictions work out, and see where they go. For for Raw, I would I would guess, like I said, that you know next week's Raw is a reboot for a lot of things. Um, I can only see them carrying over a couple feuds, uh, maybe the Divas and maybe the Shield versus Wyatt um, is the only two feuds I could kind of see where they might have enough steam to kind of ride one more pay per view or two before. Um, and other than that, though, it's just going to be kind of interesting to see where everybody kind of falls and where everybody goes after uh, Sunday. Uh, <clears throat> you can always follow me at Twitter at Rob the Many. I you know, post musings um, from time to time about MMA. Uh, right now, I'm going to be in full bore football mode. Um, probably be posting up a football podcasts eventually whenever I get a chance. Um, and so do do me a favor and just check out my Twitter because I'll probably post uh, wherever I put the podcast there. I will probably be doing another uh, quick slant on Thursday night AMP about football. Uh, there's a lot of news to go over. I think you know most of you know if you care about football at all, you probably heard you know Des Bryant broke his foot, missing four to eight weeks. It's said which is a pretty big range uh, of difference there. Uh, basically, week one fallout was basically injuries galore. Just about everybody and their mother had an injury. This just in, NFL football uh, hurts. Um, I don't know if you guys knew that or not, but that's, that's a fact. Uh, so uh, just uh, follow me on that kind of thing, because that's kind of what I'm going to be talking a lot about. Um, and uh, feel free to send me any football uh, fantasy football questions. Uh, I'm not what you would call an expert, but I, I have won my fair share of championships, and I am quite obsessive about fantasy football uh, for the majority of my uh, adult life, so I could probably help you out there as well. Uh, what about you, Big Vic? You got any plugs? Okay. All right. Well, thank you for listening to uh, Raw Recap here on Angry Marks. This has been Rob the Many. Uh, signing off for Big Vic. You guys, uh, thank you guys for listening to the show and please download and, uh, uh, and, uh, share and let everybody else know about it. Thank you so much. You have a great night. All right, Rob, man. Good work with you, bro. Later.